Uh, this session is on climate change mitigation and development. Climate change impact and adaptation has been a cross-cutting theme uh, of research at ATRI for many years. However, with the new program, we focus on the question of mitigation, on f uh, that is on finding strategies that enable development uh, without compromising the environment, both glo global and local. The four speaker in this session will cover various dimensions of climate change mitigation particularly energy choices, nutrition, and urbanization, with specific focus on India. Yeah. First, we'd like to uh, invite Dr. Narasimha Rao to the stage. Dr. Rao is the project leader for energy at IASA. He examines the relationship between energy systems, human development, and climate change. He is the recipient of a European Research Council starting grant for a project on decent living energy standard for all. His research work has also included investigating income, income inequality, infrastructure, and climate policy. Dr. Rao won the 2011 Amulya K. Reddy Prize for the best paper in the journal Energy for Sustainable Development for his paper entitled Kerosene Subsidies in India When Energy Policy Fails as Social Policy. Dr. Rao will speak on nutrition and climate, unexpected co-benefits. Dr. Rao. Thanks. I haven't said anything nice yet. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much to the organizers, uh, Sharad, Leila in particular, and Swamijit, for inviting me. Very happy to be here. Uh, so um, the topic of my, of my talk is going to be about nutrition, food, and its impact on climate change. But let me just give you a minute of context for my research. Um, so poverty levels in India are still extremely high. We know that. We have 600 million people in India who lack adequate sanitation or safe and clean toilet. 600 million people approximately who lack adequate access to improved or portable water supply. Over 700 million people who cook with chulas and inhale toxic pollutants and so on and so forth. And in order to alleviate these conditions, we need to use a large amount of energy and therefore generate a lot of emissions. At the same time, India has an obligation to try and reduce the extent of its growth to combat climate change. So wouldn't it be nice to understand and know to what extent do we really need to grow emissions in order to meet these basic living standards for people? And that's really what I'm, that's what I'm after. Now, this is a broad research project, and I'm focusing on one component, and that component specifically looks at nutrition. Now, of course, there's been a lot of work in poverty regarding food, but its relationship to climate change in the Indian context actually has not been done very much. And this is fairly new research that I'm going to show you. So there's two aspects to food, of course. First, it's the production of food and the kinds of food that we eat, but also it's the cooking of the food. And they both have separate and direct effects, uh, separate effects on climate change. And so I'll look at both of those separately. So to start with, as I mentioned, there's over 700 million people in India who cook on chulas. And specifically, women and children are affected by the pollutants. And uh, there are over 4 million deaths globally, premature deaths, also specifically amongst women and children, and in India, about a million. And so it's important to move towards clean cook stoves. And the choices usually are LPG, liquid petroleum gas, and increasingly also induction cook stoves that run on electricity. But the issue is the, both these stoves, the clean stoves, run on uh, fossil fuels by and large, and those generate more greenhouse gases. So the question is, if we make this transition over to clean cooking for health reasons, what effect will that have on climate change? So it turns out this is actually a pretty good story. From research that we've done a couple of years ago, the effect is likely to be pretty negligible. And there's a couple of reasons for it. So on the left, I'm showing you a business as usual scenario in 2030, where you have still several hundred million people using chula cook stoves. And on the right-hand side, if they transition over to a large extent to clean cook stoves, so the biomass are the, the green bar and the LPG is the gray bar. And what happens is that when you move over to clean cook stoves, you have a significant increase in energy efficiency. So you actually use a lot less energy to cook. And that is beneficial with regards to emissions. However, we also know that fossil fuels are going to increase because we're moving from biomass use to fossil use. And that's going to increase emissions. So what's the net effect? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of non-CO2 based emissions from these biomass sources short-term forces, black carbon, um, nitrous oxides, and those are offset when you move over to clean stoves. And because of the efficiency gains by moving to clean stoves, the net effect is that we have pretty much 
no change. So that's a great, we have a win-win story here. When we move off of biomass stoves towards clean cook stoves, we have a pretty negligible impact on climate. Okay, so now we've got to talk about nutrition. The status of nutrition in India is, I think, fairly well understood to most people. We have um, the highest undernourished population in the world, but it's not just that. Most people talk about undernourishment in terms of a deficiency in calories, but actually we have an even greater number of people who lack micronutrients. This is vitamins and minerals, and that's a significant component of uh, hunger. They call it hidden hunger. And on that basis, a global hunger index that includes these micronutrients, we're the 23rd highest in the world. Um, and that includes some key vitamins and minerals such as zinc and iron. So what are the dietary patterns in India? Well, we generally have a high dependence on cereals. This is partly because of poverty. But when you move to urban areas, you tend to move away a little bit from the cereals. Um, but you actually have higher calorie consumption as well. Over the last couple of decades, the, cereal, uh, the cereals that have been produced and commercialized are increasingly less nutritious. And this is things like milled rice, for example. The grains that are being sold are actually less nutritious per kilogram that's sold. India, with Bangladesh, consumes the least amount of meat per capita in the entire world, interestingly. But actually, that's not because everybody is vegetarian by choice. A lot of people don't eat meat because it's not affordable. Actually, only a third of Indians, on principle apparently, from studies done are vegetarian by principle, but most people don't eat meat because it's not affordable. But in any case, with growing income, meat consumption is rising very fast. And with growing income, we also increase, increasingly eat oily and fatty foods. So these are some of the trends. But there's a lot of regional diversity in what we eat and how we eat. These colors reflect the amount of calories contributing to a particular diet. And so the, the green and the blue ones reflect much higher calorie, uh, and the red and the mustard reflect much lower calories. So you see that there's a diversity in uh, the, kinds, the amount of cereal that's consumed, but still it, it is the highest proportion amongst foods. Meat is much smaller in terms of the calorie contribution. You can see that meat is eaten a little bit more in the south than in the north, whereas milk is consumed a little bit more in the north than in the south. And among the cereals, there's also an interesting divide where the south and the east tend to eat more rice as a share of their cereals than in the north and the west. So these dietary patterns actually matter because the nutrition content of these foods as well as the emissions of these foods are different. So we don't know what the net effect is going to be. What about the climate side of things? Well, globally, we know that meat consumption is one of the primary drivers of greenhouse gases from food consumption. And we know globally 18% of uh, greenhouse gases come from livestock. In India, agricultural emissions constitute about 20% of total emissions. And generally, for upper income diets, we know the problems that are uh, associated with increasing income, things like obesity and such, but we don't fully understand the other type, the, the, the um, nutritious problems of the poor, and that's what hidden hunger is. So, we wanted to study these, of course, and we looked at protein, iron, zinc, and vitamin A, the, some of the key micronutrients, and we wanted to look at the compatibility between improving diets so that you meet the daily requirements for all of these micronutrients, but also assess affordability. How is it going to change food budgets? Because, of course, we care about um, costs. And in order to do that, we need to relate these deficiencies to geography, urban, rural, as well as to household composition, how many children you have, so on and so forth. And for the first time, we've used data from the National Sample Survey Organization, which is about 100,000 sample uh, survey across the entire country, which gives very detailed information about foods consumed, quantities, and prices. And then we use additional data on nutritional content and as well as emissions intensities for all these foods, and then try to assess what the total amount of calorie consumption and uh, nutrient consumption all households have in India. And we know the thresholds that the government requires, um, not the government, uh, the uh, nutrition board suggests for people. And on that basis, we calculate deficiencies. So the findings are quite striking. This shows you the percent of people who have a deficiency along different income groups, the one being the, the poorest, two uh, and three and four are multiples. The two is approximately the, the poverty line defined in India. The different colors are the different micronutrients. The highest is vitamin A, followed by iron, followed by zinc, followed by protein. And the dark lines are urban and the, the dashed lines are rural. And what you find, two consistent trends, which is that urban deficiencies are higher than rural. And that is not what people generally feel is the case. Secondly, with increasing income, you have lower deficiencies, which is, it, that is expected. 
The extent of these deficiencies, of course, are subject to uncertainty, but what's most important about these is the trends. What about the regional diversity? Well, so we've done this by state as well. And this is, on every column, you're seeing each of the different nutrients, and urban versus rural, and you find that there's, of course, diversity and different levels of darkness. The darker the cells are, the higher the share of people with a deficiency. But there's an interesting trend. If you look closely, you find for several of these, the south and east parts of the country are a little bit darker. The south and east regions seem to have slightly higher deficiencies. And we weren't sure what that was, but after a little bit of investigation, it seemed to have some a dependence on the extent of rice in the share, cereal share that people were consuming. So we decided to investigate this in more detail. And we looked at, for different groups of people, uh, in the East four zones and in different income groups, urban and rural, we plotted the share of rice that people have in their diets against the iron deficiencies. And you find a clear relationship that those with have a higher share, who have a higher share of rice in their diets tend to have higher iron deficiencies and, and the opposite for wheat uh, in the share of their diets. And you'll find that the groups of households in the East and the South tend to be right on the top right of the left chart and the top left of the, the wheat uh, chart. Um, so there seems to be some, something here with regards to the, uh, the cereal share and the, and the dependence on rice, which is, which is interesting. So we have pretty high deficiencies, and now we need to understand, well, what can we do about this and what's its effect on climate change? Um, so we set up what's called an optimization analysis. It's a very convenient way to try to uh, reach a certain goal while keeping certain constraints. So in our case, our constraint is we want to make sure everybody has the right amount of nutrition, we want to make sure people's food budgets are respected, but we want to see if we can minimize emissions. So can we achieve our, our development goals while keeping emissions down? And then we had various sort of constraints to try and respect people's preferences. Things like, uh, let's keep food groups and their shares of calories constant. So people can switch between rice and wheat and bajra, but they can't switch between rice and, uh, and bananas. Um, and that way we're kind of respecting cultural constraints a little bit. And then we have some bounds also on the extent to which you can shift within groups so that you don't all of a sudden shift entirely to a new food that you probably wouldn't do in reality. And then we try to do sensitivities in all of this. Now, just to give you a taste of uh, what kind of foods would we ideally like to eat, this would be sort of a, be a precursor to the results. Uh, I realize this is a very complicated chart, but I'll just, it's um, uh, showing you on the, on the y axis, on the y going upwards, the emissions intensity of foods per nutrient. And on the right hand, on the x-axis, it's the uh, nutrient content, uh, the cost of the nutrient in terms of uh, rupees per protein or rupees per zinc. So what you're looking for is that on the bottom left are the foods that are kind of the good foods because they are less emissions intensive and they're cheaper. And you tend to find that for proteins that lentils and pulses tend to be much more attractive than meats. When you look at zinc and the other micronutrients, you tend to find that Bajra is a superfood. It seems to show up always on the bottom left. And the millets tend to be much more attractive than rice and, and wheat, is, but wheat is a little more attractive than rice. And with regards to vitamin A, it's quite clear that you need to eat dark leafy vegetables and carrots and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what we find. So again, this sounds, looks very complicated, but it's simply showing you the, in all these different scenarios that we ran, what happened to emissions when we ran these scenarios. The red line shows you a zero change, and what's below the red line means the emissions went down. And so for different, of the, different groups across, but for urban and rural, we're finding that almost in all cases, emissions went down when people had these healthy diets within their food budgets. And the only one instance where the emissions went up, which is the triangles above the red line, are the case when we actually minimize cost. We said, let's just make your diet as cheap as possible, but still achieving all your nutritional goals. And when we did that, we found the emissions rose up because people would consume more of uh, emissions intensive foods like beef in the Northeast, which happened to be cheaper than other forms of protein. But that's kind of an exception. So generally, it seems to be a good story that this very important development goal of improving our diets uh, seems to not have an effect on climate significantly. And there was also a thought that you know, animal sources and meat in particular is more nutrient dense usually. And so one would expect that more meat consumption is good. But given where prices are today, if you consider affordability, it actually makes more sense to move towards pulses. Now all of this is of course hypothetical and you know, 
uh, it brings up issues about uh, how, do you, how do you really force this kind of change. Um, our our pre preferences for food patterns are very embedded. But this is what we need to do. And perhaps some directions for policy, if, if this holds up to further scrutiny, would be that we need to promote cost cereals, things like bajra, millet, and, and jowar. Uh, and this has actually been found before, and a lot of nutritionists uh, we have, I have a collaborator who's actually a nutritionist in the Public Health Foundation in, in Delhi, uh, that this is something that is, uh, is known. And uh, improving of the public distribution system so that people actually uh, get the full benefit of subsidies, because a lot of people consume a lot of rice and wheat outside of the public distribution system, which makes it more expensive. And if they, if they pay less for their cereals, they have more flexibility in what else they eat. So that is what I wanted to share with you. There's, there's additional work to be done, of course, with regards to looking at price dynamics, because if you change the production of bajra significantly, it'll alter prices. There'll be effects on production, uh, land, et cetera, and this is all further work that needs to be done. But so far, it seems to be fairly good news. Thank you.